Over the years, you're gonna see many FL5 Type R videos. From people having fun to doing stupid things to the car. Or in my case, just simulating driving in my garage because I don't wanna add miles to it. Here's the thing. This video is gonna be a bit different. It's gonna talk about why I bought the FL5 Type R and why I almost didn't. My history with the brand, including my love and hatred for it, and the horrible dealership experience that I had that I pretty much swore off this company as a whole and what's changed and kind of moving towards the future and letting go of the past. I'm gonna interview the owner of Brilliance Crystal Lake Honda where I bought this car and kind of my thought process of what this vehicle is in the time frame that it was created from my discussions with the chief engineer. So let's get started. <laughs> My interest in the Civic Type R started very early on. Like many people of my generation, we viewed the 6th gen hatchback 98 spec, 99 spec Type R to be the gold standard. It was the golden era of Honda and that car was just amazing. And it was amazing because we couldn't have it in the United States, of course we wanted it. As time progressed, more and more Type Rs had come out in different countries and we never got one until the FK8. And I was lucky enough to be able to drive the LE, the first version, the updated or refreshed version, of course, the Mugen Type R, the Mugen modified one. And I was just always left mixed about that car. It wasn't the Type R of old, and it was vastly overstyled. You had stuck on body panels, you had fake vents everywhere. It just, you couldn't tell if it was coming or going, but it was a very forward product. And I know the people, the FK8 owners, look at the FL5 Type R and they're like, it's too sedate. It's boring. And in some ways, you know, the updated interior and exterior is more throwback. And that's why I like it. And I understand it if you don't. But, you know, the FK8 was a car I would have never considered. And when I saw the new FL5 being released, some of the teaser footage, the pictures, and then the initial videos that came out from Honda, I'm like, I really like it. I could get behind this car. I don't know if I would own it, but I could get behind it. And Jack's like, you know what? You should ask our Honda reps in our region to see if you can get an allocation. I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm not really sold. And we've done so many Honda projects now. We did the CRX, we did the original Integra Type R, the, the DC2 Integra Type R, and you know all these legacy products that we've driven, including the S2000, it's hard to drive those cars, seriously drive them, and then get into a modern Honda and be excited for it. And, and really, it's just a generational bridge. Most of us that have come up with Honda think these cars are not the same as they used to be. And, and there's truth to it. We're never going back to that era. So I kind of was like, I don't know if I want to do this again. Not only that, I've had some horrible experiences with the brand as a whole, from service to dealership experience, just just a lot of things and it's tacked up over the years. So we talked to our Honda rep and Lynn's like, you know, let's see if we can get a hold of the region, which she did, she followed through and the regional rep called me and was like, hey, I think we can get you an allocation. You know, what color do you want? I'm like, I only want red and I'm not gonna pay over MSRP. He's like, well, we'll see if we can make it happen. He's like, what dealership do you wanna work with? What area are you in? I'm like, well, I'll work with any dealership except Brilliance Honda. <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, that's the only dealership we work with. I'm like, well, he's like, why? I'm like, well, let me tell you, when I was 20 years old and struggling, I went to that, I went to Crystal Lake Honda, which Brilliance bought it out, which I didn't know really the whole story behind it. But Crystal Lake Honda, I'd been there multiple times to buy a Honda product, and every single time I went there, I got the typical, like, uh, this car's too much for you. Um, don't get in the car, don't touch it. No, you can't test drive it. Uh, all the typical nasty things. This car's so rare, you know, we're charging over for it. You know, we got 20 people on this car, I don't have time. Just all the things that you don't wanna hear, especially as a younger person from a dealership, is what they did. And when we finally went back to buy a used car because we couldn't find, I was looking for a specific six gen Civic, a 97. We only had about $5,000 budget. And the, this 97 DX they had there checked all the boxes. It was manual. As it turns out, three years later when we paid it off, we went to go get the title. And it turns out that dealership took out two loans on the car. So not only could we not get the title, we found out that 
we had a huge thing on our credit reports, both of us, for a car that we didn't pay for, even though we paid for it with a different bank. So it took like six months to sort this out and to get the title from the bank and to fix the issues with my credit at least, and it was horrible. So I, of course I didn't want to work with Brilliance Honda, and he's like, well, I'll talk to the owner, I'll let him know what's going on. So as the time got closer, I'm like, I don't think I want this car, Jack. And it wasn't until we went to the press event where it was like, okay, let's see what this is like. And after talking to the chief engineer and driving this car on the track, it wasn't just the matter of it was a new shiny object. It was really, really good. And the fact that the chief engineer had his hands in, you know, chassis development on the S2000, he worked on the NSX Type R back in the day, and all the legacy Honda products you know, that were important, at least to me, and I think to him as well, this was their last ditch effort at an internal combustion type R. And you felt that it was special, even though it was kind of just an evolution of the FK8. It was everything that they could possibly do with this car, given the budget they had in engineering. And it just felt good. It felt like this could be one of the last Honda products that we'll ever see before they go to hybrid and EV. So I was like, all right, now I want it. And when it came to the dealership experience, I talked to the owner, I sat down with him, kind of wanted to get a feel for where he felt the dealership experience was going and his view on cars like the Type R. Hello, my name is Kevin Keith. I'm the owner of Dorian's Honda in Crystal Lake, Illinois. So I, I guess I have a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, I started selling cars in 1996. Before that, I actually worked for a manufacturer for five years. So I saw that side of things. And I went to car sales. Uh, I was lucky enough to get my first entrepreneurial opportunity to buy this Honda store 10 years later. So when we purchased the dealership in 2006 in April, um, it was a very tough, had a very tough reputation. Uh, earned, they earned that reputation. So it easily took me uh, a year plus to turn that reputation around so that people had the confidence uh, to step foot in our store. And a lot of that started with the personnel and changing the mindset of, uh, and changing the culture. And it started with me, it's top down, being present, being here every day when we're open uh, so that um, what my expectation levels are and how we're gonna conduct business we're executed. And sometimes in the car dealership world, that doesn't always happen. And you might have a rogue associate uh, do some things that, you know, earn you a poor reputation. And like I said, and that is deserved, but very fortunate. We have a very tenured staff. Most of these people have been with me for over 10 years, you know, and how this business has evolved since 2006. Um, you know, obviously the online presence, the transparency, the ability to look up vehicle pricing where before it was something that was very held close to the chest. We didn't want you to know what invoice was. Uh, now it doesn't, that is not even a topic of conversation. Now it's, okay, what, uh, you know, what does the market say the, the value of these cars are? And everyone kind of follows along with that. Sometimes there are places that have gotcha or surprises or addendums on vehicles with, you know, accessories that you didn't know or want on there. There's too much of that going on, in my opinion, in the marketplace, um, and that is creating the stereotype of what a car dealership experience is. Uh, I'm 100% going away from that. Um, without charging over MSRP, I have nothing forced on you that you have to buy if you buy a car here. Do we sell? Yes. Do we help? Yes. You may want all season floor mats. I'll sell them to you, but we're not gonna force them for you to buy the car so you have all season floor mats so I can make a couple of extra dollars. And, you know, we don't talk about horsepower and things like that as much anymore. People wanna know how their phone integrates with the vehicle. That's the priority. And that's where, that's a big change that we've had over the last five years. And the manufacturers are scrambling just when they think they have that technology uh, figured out, it's already changed. And uh, software updates and all those things that's what's flooding our service departments now. It's much less is, is software issues than um, you know, maintenance or repairs. Uh, we still have those, but software issues are, are the things that are really, uh, we've had to get very good at. And um, you know, car people just aren't that, especially uh, you know, people 50 on up trying to sell cars to people that are 30 and under. And the 30 and unders know a lot more about the software of their cars than the people 
that are 50 and up. And there's a disconnect with that um, that we deal with all the time. So the, you know, the Type R, um, the pricing on the Type R is always a, a big topic of conversation. And you know, the Civic is supposed to be the affordable, um, fun to drive Honda. And they've just, you know, they've built something very special. And uh, they're not gonna build that many of them. You know, I think it's gonna be a thousand this year uh, for, this, for the first model year coming out in 2023. So uh, when you have something that's only a thousand and it's special, um, you know, and there's a lot of interest, it drives the price up. Honda may put a MSRP of, you know, in the mid $40,000 range uh, on the vehicle, uh, but if five people wanna buy it, it most likely will go to the highest bidder. That's not the dealer saying, hey, I want to sell it for the most, some do. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but if the market demand brings a certain dollar amount, that's what it will sell for. Just like your home. Um, if, you're, if you can sell your home for X amount of dollars, you're gonna do it. Dealers are gonna do it here. I won't do it, um, which is why I'm gonna donate the proceeds for anything over it uh, to a veterans group, because uh, I think that's the right thing to do. But that still doesn't fix the consumer pricing problem. And I don't know if it'll ever be fixed on specialty cars, whether it's a Civic or any other brand that you read about and hear about that are doing tens and twenties and thirties thousands uh, over MSRP, because uh, that's what the market is bringing. It's a car is worth what someone wants to pay. Um, may not want to hear that. That's the reality of it. it. You know, I don't know how that rectifies itself. The market forces are driving the prices up and uh, it's unfortunate don't like it, uh, but that's just the realities of it. Now it's very clear that in my case, I'm walking into a dealership where I did not have to pay over MSRP. And I know that's gonna make a lot of people angry. It's gonna make a lot of people question like, why do I get special treatment or people, the media get special treatment? And I'm just gonna put it this way. You know, we've done probably six or seven Civic videos of this generation from Type R regular cars, and there's millions of views on them. And, you know, I really like this car. I, I really like this generation car. It's, it's no BS. And I think, you know, when you know 100% it's helped to move volume or move cars for a company or a brand, it's basically one of the least things they can do as a professional courtesy to help one of the people that's essentially helping them on the media side sell cars to get something like this for MSRP. That's really all it is. I didn't buy this to flip it. When I made the decision to do it, I wanted to keep it and I wanted it nice. And when I took delivery of this, I had very specific instructions to the dealership not to PDI it. You know, I sat there while the technician pulled out the spring spacers, did his basic stuff, but not pulling off the covers on the seats, not running it through a meat grinder, not pulling off the film. And it was very weird for them. You know, you know, typical Honda cars when they come off the truck and you can even see I was there for the truck delivery and they made sure that I was gonna be there for it. You know, Honda doesn't spend a lot of money for logistics to move these cars on trucks. They're barely protected compared to some other brands. Um, a lot of them come off with little scratches and scuffs, and even this car had a scratched wheel when it came off the truck. You know, they're not used to people coming into the dealership and being picky, but in the case of Brilliance Honda, they knew that I was going to be picky about it. And I think a lot of dealerships understand this is a special car, and the buyers have a different expectation of the dealership when they do it. So if you're looking at this car, do not feel bad about dictating to them, like, look, this is what I want done. Don't touch anything. I don't want people driving it. I don't want people taking the film off. And in my case, you know, watching that process, I could tell that they did take a lot of care. The, the dealership was very excited for the Type R's to come in because it is different. It's not a Honda Odyssey. It's not a Ridgeline. It's not a commodity car as much. So there is something special about it. People are excited by it. Even when I picked it up, the first thing I did is I barely drove and I took it to Chicago Auto Pros, which you've seen on this channel before. I wanted to get it paint corrected. And as it turns out, the paint is quite different than old Honda paint. It is very hard to clear. So it's more like German paint than Japanese paint or traditional Honda paint that was always soft. So it was a little bit harder to correct, but there were far less imperfections in the paint in the past. 
the body panels and body gaps or the panel gaps were far less than what they were in the last model year at the Swindon factory. So the build quality, at least on the exterior and the fit and finish, and some of the paint match is way better than it used to be. Clearly in the factory, they're not doing what we saw like on many car companies where they paint all the body panels together on a cart, you know, fenders, bumpers, hoods, trunk lids. They don't go all down the same paint through the same paint booth. So the bumpers and uh, some of the panels are separated. They're not tied to the VIN. So there is a little bit of a paint match issue on the front bumper and the back bumper like you've seen on other cars or other Honda products, but it's not nearly as bad as the products we saw from the Swindon factory. So overall, I feel like there is a sense of better QA or better quality control um, coming out of the Japanese factory that one we saw in the past. And the paint did look very good, even in the dirt and when they cleaned it up and put the PPF on the front. I really did feel a sense of pride of having this car and seeing it in the garage. It's a car that I look back on and I really do want to take care of it. it you know, $40,000 plus is a lot of money. And I think a lot of the people that are looking at this look at it the same way. And they look at it the same way I do, that they refuse to pay an excess of amount of money for a car that's supposed to be attainable to the normal person. Brilliance Crystal Lake, you know, after talking to them, they were very adamant about how they only sell cars for MSRP. But the reality is, you know, when you have a limited production car, let's say they get a couple allocations uh, to, for more Type R's after this video. You know, people are going to be knocking down their door to try to get on a list to get it for MSRP. And if there's not a lot to go around, that means people with more money are going to be bidding to try to pay more money to get these cars. And it's just a sad point of where we're at as a culture and society that these enthusiast cars have gotten to be like the golden goose because they're not making so many that now it's driving up prices. This wasn't as big of an issue in the past. I think looking at this car as a whole, driving it on the street, really looking at it, it it's a Civic. It's like an in-between of a Civic Si, the, the Civic Hatch Sport, and of course, the harder edge of the Type R. In individual mode, obviously, in comfort mode for suspension, it's very, very comfortable on the road. You can put car seats in here, you're not gonna feel bad putting your family in this car, and I think that's why it's a special vehicle. It really does have the economy and the usability of a small CUV. And I think that's why people are just like clamoring for it. It doesn't look horrible. It doesn't look too shouty depending on the color that you get. And, you know, there are optional accessories for this thing too to make it feel a little bit more special right out of the gate. Like the carbon fiber spoiler. Obviously with a red car, there's a red inlay on the carbon wing that's optional. It's about $2,000 to $2,500 depending on where, what dealership you get it from and it does have that special factor to it if that's something you want. The difference in the different color floor mats with the red floor mats or these optional black ones, and of course, all the different little things you can do on the interior from shift knob to the Alcantara steering wheel, all of that that you can do is nice out of the gate. And when King Motorsports, the authorized Mugen distributor for the US gets all of their aero parts, which I'm gonna be testing on this car, you're gonna have more wing options for more aerodynamics. The front wing, or the front splitter is gonna be there and these are all track tested in Japan with the original Honda engineers and the Mugen engineers. You're gonna have a lot of options for this car because I think a lot of companies are going all in on it, knowing this is gonna be the last of its kind for Honda as a brand. I feel like this is definitely something that people are gonna love going forward. And I'll be curious to see how I feel about it over time, because typically, you know, the honeymoon wears off pretty quickly when you're in and out of a lot of cars. I will say, this is not my dream car, um, but it's one of the cars that I've been more excited by. And that's really strange, because I think the thing that does it for me, when you look at the underbody, the thought to it, the thought of design, it's a car that I have zero problem driving on the street. And if I want to take it to the track, it will do that to a certain extent. With the right oil, with the right alignment, you know, taking the pins out of the shock tower or the strut tower there, you know, you might be able to get a little bit more negative camber and you really don't have to touch much more besides, you know, brake fluid and brake pads and just some new tires. And I think that's a huge pro for a car in the $40,000 range that it can do dual purpose and it can be more than just a garage toy that you drive on the weekends. But I'm gonna leave it at that. There was a lot I covered, but this is the story of why I bought the FL5 Type R.
I've said this in other videos and I don't want to beat a dead horse. Buying a Type R and making a video about it may seem very simple and in many ways it is more simple, but it's still a project. So it wouldn't be possible, namely for some of these projects without the Patreon support. You know, it just, it, they subsidize the, the viewers and the Patreons subsidize a lot of these big projects from traveling and all of that. So a huge, huge shout out to everybody that's on there. And my partnership with Dell Technologies, now they're supporting me on the creator side. I supported servers and all their infrastructure through thick and thin, even when it was bad and I had problems, I always had great support from them. And you learn what works. And the precision lineup, mobile and physical desktops were always amazing for me on the corporate side. And now that's what I'm using in my business. The Dell Mobile Precision workstations allow me the power to have multiple desks where I can move one machine from desk to desk. Uh, for editing workflow, for business workflow, and then having a dedicated workstation set up for color correction. This is the first video I'm releasing in HDR. And while it may not be perfect, I'm trying to push the boundaries in terms of video creation, something that will have staying power. I do not want to make disposable content. And having HDR workflows kind of future-proofs me for different formats in the future. And without this support from Dell, without the support from NVIDIA and RTX Quadro processors, I wouldn't be able to handle that workflow without these beastly laptops. But when Jack books me on travel four times a month and I still have to get those videos out, that type of hardware allows me or gives me the tool to keep this going, to make it worthwhile and also to feed the beast, which sadly, sometimes you just have to get things out in order to pay myself and to pay Jack. I, I really hope that you guys appreciate this and I look forward to seeing your feedback on future videos as we're pushing the boundaries in visuals and storytelling.